and welcome to the Income Bully exclusive. My name is Lewis. We're here with Nathan, my good friend, Hello. and it's the Freaky Friday Night Marketing Talk. We're meeting here every other Friday night at 8 p.m. Central, uh, sponsored by our good friends over at Bright Local. Those guys are awesome. And uh, yeah, tonight is going to be a slew of different topics a mixture of of goodies and you know what's hot and what's not right now uh april 2015 it should be a good one ladies and gentlemen do not get out your seats go get your water right now if you drink tea like me and nathan go drink your tea go get your tea right now uh turn your phone off i already turned my phone off uh <laughs> <laughs> silence your phone Tell your dog to go away and pull out that trusty, handy-dandy pen and paper because it's about to get interesting. <clears throat> it is indeed. We, uh, we're doing a different format tonight. We usually have like one solid, broad topic, but uh, you know, this week's a little bit different. We're going to talk about a, a couple different things and, and a variety of topics. So what we're going to discuss, some of you already know, we're going to talk about uh, the April 1st or April 21st mobile update, um, how it impacts local SEO, what all it impacts, all that good stuff. We're going to talk about the number one biggest ranking factor in local SEO. It is number one. It is something that uh, I mean, it, it can help you dominate, but it's a slightly, slightly gray hat. Um, or maybe it's a white hat, but the, the hat that's white is a little bit dirty. Maybe that's, maybe that's it. So um, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about common mental barriers, how you could overcome them, the myth and truth behind not keeping all your eggs in one basket. And uh, I'm going to share with you guys a, a little trick with Mobile Renegade. I, I'm sure a lot of you already have it. Some of you might not. So, uh, But uh, this trick is, is something that could really skyrocket your conversions when cold calling. Um, I, we'll, we'll get into that later. Lewis is pretty excited about that one. Um, he has yeah. no idea what I'm going to talk about. So, yeah. Actually, um, before, before the webinar started, I was really mad because we were talking about it. And... and you guys are going to see in just a few minutes what the slide looks like. And I said, oh, my God, what the heck is he going to say? Because I don't know if you guys remember or not. And, you know, <laughs> the the time that he posted a video, it took me like a month to realize he posted a video. And then <laughs> I was like, what the heck? He posted a video. So, you know, you have to regularly check the blog to see that, I guess, uh, um, or check your emails. I don't check my emails enough. But uh, uh so he surprised me with that one little trick he had in the video. I'm super excited for tonight. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, give me a two if you're excited to see what we're going to talk about. If you're uh, ready to kind of learn something new or uh, refreshing up on things you already know. Two, two, two across the board. Wonderful. Two, two, two. I love it, man. Cool. Good deal. So let's uh let's go ahead and get get into this, huh? All right. So the April twenty first mobile update. I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard about this, right? I mean you've you've heard about mobile get in, mobile apocalypse, whatever buzzword uh people are spreading about this and how it's gonna change the world and change it's gonna put SEOs in danger and trouble and all this hype and hoopla. Um, but really, uh, when it comes to local SEO, uh, will it, will this impact local results? Google says no. Um, I forget what conference it was. It, Lewis, maybe you you saw some news. I'm not sure if you did, but it was uh, uh it was this guy uh, at the Brighton SEO conference, I think, um, from Google, of course, talking about how this is only going to impact, you know, regular organic search. Um, it's not going to impact local. The local algorithm, organic algorithm, two completely different things. So while we initially expected this to affect local, like the seven-pack rankings, um, it's not, according to Google. And uh, I, I pretty much agree with that, but not everybody does. Um, there, there's a lot of other people that have other theories, but we'll, we'll get into that uh, 
in a minute here. So uh, what all will it impact? It will impact organic, um, organic searches on a mobile device. Um, it'll impact uh, the in-depth articles uh, that you see in certain search results. Um, it'll impact news websites, any kind of news results. But uh, the local, if you're searching from your cell phone, like a roofer in Dallas or a restaurant in Miami, um, whatever search you're doing on a, a mobile device and it's going to be a local search that pulls up the pack, it's not going to be affected. Um, it, it just won't be. Now, maybe if it's a local organic search, like uh, if, it, if they don't display um, the seven pack or the snack pack or um, whatever local results with the ABC, um, Google My Business, Google Places, Google Plus Local, whatever you want to call it next week, um, it's not going to impact those searches. So you guys could calm down. Your clients aren't going to be screwed. You're not going to be screwed if your site's not, you know, if it's not responsive or not mobile. Um, it's just for mobile or great organic searches. But, you know, really your clients, anybody that comes to you for web design, they just want a regular website. Uh, you might as well be doing responsive web design now. I mean, this is just, you know, the first big algorithm uh, rollout when it comes to mobile. So you might as well go ahead and jump on the bandwagon, get that stuff taken care of because you could all, you, you could pretty much guarantee that this is going to be something that's going to be um, on a more broad scale eventually. I mean, does that make sense to you, Lewis? That it's going to be, maybe it's only going to impact some searches now, but you know, eventually it's going to pretty much be worldwide. It's going to be every type of search. Everyone uh, is going to need, you know, mobile optimization or responsive design. Right, and you know, funny enough, I, one of the theories that I have and I did mention it earlier when we were talking, but uh, one of the things that I, I think it is, I think it's just a part of a bigger rollout. And I think that it's a, it's a way to test uh, the organic searches and then ultimately it will affect local businesses. Uh, but I think it would be catastrophe if they just did everything at once, you know? I mean, there's a lot of local businesses that, you know, they're years behind what where they should be as far as what their website should look like or or how um, or how responsive their website is or whatnot. Uh, so I think that I think that a big part of it is is uh, um, one they want to avoid a, a just a, a massive uh, catastrophe because obviously guys if you think about it on a holistic approach you know. Google obviously they make revenue from the people that come to their search, you know, to their search engine. And um, if if it was too drastic of a change, then uh, you know, ultimately keeping the the business owners who continue to put money into into uh, their web, I mean their website, who put money into Google's pocket, you know. Uh, they have to keep them happy, but also keep the consumers happy. I don't know. It's, I feel like I feel like it's just part of a bigger scheme, and that, uh, or I, I guess not a scheme, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's it's part of something bigger than what it really is. And uh, and ultimately, it probably will affect local, but I don't know. Maybe it's just a grounds for testing right now uh, to see kind of what happens and and how. How it affects the results, and um, uh, it, it's ultimately about making the consumers uh, uh, happier. You know, more consumers equals more more revenue. You know, I'm sure we can all agree with that. But that's just my thoughts. Yeah, so I think that it's more of like a uh, I I don't know. I think it's more of a user experience type thing. Exactly. Um, you know, but but when you look at local, and this actually happens right now, if you do some local searches, and it's not for everybody, but um, you know, some local searches, you could you'll see the the information like the the phone number or whatever is displayed in and the the local results, but um, you know, occasionally, 
the website won't be displayed. Like there will, it, it won't show like a website. It'll show like the um, Google Plus URL, and that's it. Like it, it won't display the website, and it, I think it already makes those adjustments. You see, um, the organic search right now. The way that it, it's working is organic is organic, whether it's um, on your phone or your desktop. But local results are already different. There, there's a little bit of difference between phone results and desktop results. So there's already a difference there. Um, and uh, Google does sometimes hide the website, I guess, if they think that it's not um, appropriate for mobile mobile users, or maybe there's malware on it. I, I haven't really looked into it too much, but I've seen it happen. I've seen I, I see it happening on a regular basis. So there's that, and um, I guess that that kind of covers it because you know there's just one organic algorithm. There's not um, two different ones for mobile and desktop like there is with the local results. So, I mean, I, I think that kind of explains it a little bit. Um, now, not everybody thinks the same way I do. Uh, not everybody believes what Google's saying. Uh, there's, there's actually quite a few SEO experts or gurus or um, authorities on the matter that think that Google's just lying to us or that Google just doesn't know what Google's doing, which is understandable. There's been cases in the past where Google says one thing, but the reality is something else. I mean, it happens. Um, I, I've seen it happen uh, quite often, actually. So, <laughs> um, you know, they, they have a right to kind of be a little afraid of this or think that Google's not being truthful or just not knowing what's really going to impact local. But the truth of the matter is they're completely different algorithms. So if there is something, and this is exactly why um, like people that think that a certain site should be hit by Penguin or Panda, and they aren't, and they're still ranking very well in local results, it's because it's a different algorithm. The algorithm is not for organic. It's you know, it's local. It's showing the seven pack. So the the businesses, websites, listings that are in the seven pack are sort of not completely immune, but they uh, they have a lot of protection when it comes to Google penalties and algorithm tweaks because it's a mobile algorithm. It's based on location relevance and keyword relevance or industry relevance. Uh, we've talked about that before when it comes to link building, citations. Uh, actually, that was one of the first webinars we did. It was on just local SEO. So um, the the local algorithm is, is much different than organic. It, things are always different. Link building is different. On page is different. It's all based on location relevance, industry relevance. So um, I, I think it's it's not something to really worry about if you don't if your clients don't have a mobile website, I mean, they should have one, but um, I don't think that they're just going to be hidden or not displayed or penalized for it uh, like like a lot of people do. Um, it, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, they said it's not going to impact the local algorithm. I don't see why it will. So um, not, not saying that it can't happen eventually. I think eventually um, it'll impact pretty much everything. Um, which goes into the next question, will this affect desktop searches? Uh, which it won't immediately, but I think it makes sense that uh, even if you have a mobile compatible website and Google already announced that their standard is responsive design, it makes sense based on all the different types of screen sizes, whether it's all these different phones, smartphones, tablets, laptops, you have the mini laptops, you have desktops with small screens, big screens, super wide screens, you have televisions, um, you have all these different different screen sizes. And, you know, just having a regular fixed width website with a mobile um, redirect script, 
you know, that covers just a very small range of users. It makes sense for Google to cater to uh, their users. It, it makes sense for you um, to build websites for the users, the user experience, to adjust based on the screen size. I mean, that's why I think responsive will 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 be dominating search probably within the next couple of years. I mean, it makes sense to me. I mean, what what about you, Lewis? I mean, do you ever uh, you ever watch YouTube? Do you ever go to websites like on a TV? I don't know if you have that hooked up, but I do. And uh, I know a lot of people that do, and that's you know a TV, but um, you you also have all kinds of different people with different size screens, different size laptops. Um, you know, it it just makes sense to me that Google would want you know everybody to have a responsive design. So maybe it doesn't affect desktop searches right now, but I think you could pretty much guarantee in the upcoming year, or maybe a couple years, that it will be a very heavy ranking factor, not just for mobile and not just for organic, but local as well, um, pretty much everything. I mean, it just makes sense. So uh, do mobile or responsive sites get a ranking boost in desktop searches? Right now, there's, there's a lot of people that think there's some correlation with this, that uh, mobile sites or responsive sites are getting favored in not just organic, but in local results in the seven pack, the ABC spots. Um, they think that, you know, Google's weighing heavily um, when a site has this. So does it, does it really, I don't see any real evidence of it giving any type of uh, ranking boost, whether it's in desktop or even mobile. Um, and uh, the reason I, maybe you could make an argument for it, um, for making an impact, but what I think is really the, the indirect impact here is Google takes a look at engagement and it doesn't have to be social engagement. It doesn't have to be on Twitter or Facebook or Google Plus or any other network out there. What I think Google's looking at um, when it comes to engagement is brand engagement. What is this business doing online? Like, what are what are they doing? Is it just a simple website? What are they doing? Are they, uh, do they have a website? They're making changes to it. Do they have a blog? Do they have uh, responsive design? Um, are they getting citations? Are they doing this and that and everything else? You know, it, I think they are looking at activity and uh, not necessarily social activity, just activity that surrounds the, the website, the brand. Um, and I think it makes a lot of sense. And uh, actually, I think it was on Moz. Um, if you, I, I'm not sure how many of you guys check out the Moz blog, but I think there was a Whiteboard Friday uh, video and talking about engagement being a a ranking factor, but not the engagement that everybody's talking about, um, like social signals. They're talking about like bigger things with the website. Um, and I agree with it. It could be something as simple as a mobile mobile site. It could be uh, working to improve your, your page speed, your loading times. So I, I think there's a, you know, it, it's based on engagement, not whether, you know, you have a responsive site. Like at this moment, of course, you know, like as I said earlier, that's probably all going to change relatively quickly. Um, Lewis, are you there? Is there anything that you want to add? Uh, Lewis might have gotten disconnected here, so I guess I will uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. All right, so the biggest factor ranking in local this is this is something uh, you know maybe some of you have already um, checked out some of the seven pack ranking analysis um, where I uh, basically find a location and a search term and I just analyze like the different points of the rankings like 
uh, their on-page optimization, backlinks, reviews, uh, citations, their consistency, different things like that, um, where I'm where I'm just analyzing it and uh, saying what I think is causing uh, this business to rank, why it's ranking here, ranking there, ranking last, wherever. Um, one of the one of the things that I've noticed, um, and I forget which week it was, but uh, one example was uh, the search term Atlanta plumber, or plumber in Atlanta. I forget the exact search term, but uh, the interesting thing was uh, a business was ranking, I think, in the number two spot, and it didn't deserve to be there. Um, it didn't deserve to be anywhere in the seven pack at all, period. Uh, it was so awful. So um, the reason why it was ranking is because of the business name. The business name was Atlantis Plumbing. Um, and you have Atlantis, Atlantis, and then plumbing. And it's really interesting because it's not just, it wasn't an exact match with uh, the business name, like Atlantis, but it seemed like Google was taking like a partial match out of that name. Just the, aside from the, IS, like Atlant, and then the, the IS, uh, plumbing. Like it, it was overvaluing that in the business name, in the business name in the seven pack. Um, another thing that I, I noticed in, this was when I was talking to Lewis. Lewis got disconnected. So um, I was talking to Lewis, and we're looking at Houston SEO or uh, SEO in Houston. And a lot of the businesses that were ranking in Houston have that in their business name, in the business name and the local results. So when they go to claim their Google Plus profile, their Google My Business profile, they have that in the business name. They have the keywords and location as the business name. And one of them even took it a step further. So they had, a domain name, I forget what the domain was. It wasn't really related to, um, I, I mean, you wouldn't be able to tell that it was just an SEO domain name, um, but they had a subdomain. So they had Houston SEO dot, whatever the domain was, dot com. And they also had Houston SEO in the, the domain or, the business name so <laughs> it was it was really interesting to see that and you know some of these people are living in in cities or listed in cities uh, outside of Houston which is really rare big city um, to see any kind of surrounding cities be ranking in the big city um, it, it's extremely rare so the biggest ranking factor when it comes to local SEO is the business name it is definitely the business name listed in Google My Business, or your Google Plus profile. So, um, you know, if Andrea says, uh, so having the keywords in the URL, it's bad, like Turin remodeling. No, it, it's not bad. That's like a, that, that's basically like an exact match domain. But uh, what we're talking about here is the business name being in the, actual listing like uh let's say your let's say your business name we're, we're going to use like the houston seo example let's say your business name is um bobsconsulting.com or bobs consulting and your url or your domain name is bobsconsulting.com so what what they would do to rank and this isn't technically um within the the google guidelines but what they do to rank is go to their Google My Business page or profile or setup and put in Houston SEO or Houston SEO company or, you know, something that is a different business name than the real business name. So uh, th it's something that that is is really taking over and spreading massively in search, uh, in local search. And... Um, and of course, having like a domain name exact match um, or having a keyworded domain name obviously helps. 
But uh, this is just something interesting that's really, really spreading. Um, a lot of a lot of SEO people um, have kind of figured it out, or they're they're starting to implement it. And this is something that you could do. You could probably instantly do this if you don't care if you uh, get penalized or the listing is invalid in about a year or two, whenever Google wants to adjust this. Um, you could really benefit from this. It requires almost no work. Like you don't have to do any kind of backlinking. Um, your citation building is pretty minimal. Um, you almost instantly shoot up in the rankings. And and Lewis tried this. He he tried this the other day, um, just as sort of a, a test with his pressure washing company. And he he made the change and he shot up to number two. So I I thought that was pretty neat. Like he he did it and. Uh, just a couple minutes later, like literally minutes later, he shot up to number two. So it's it's definitely something interesting, and um, you know it, it depends on how you feel about whether you want to do just pure white hat type stuff, or if you're okay crossing into the gray lines. Um, me personally, the way I feel about it is. You know, I, I don't get paid to um, stay within the Google guidelines. Um, I do the best I can because I want long-term effects for my clients. But, you know, it, if something takes a year to rank, you know, well, what's the point? Like, they're, they're going negative. They're not getting a positive return on investment. So, you know, I absolutely will cut corners when I can. And I tell them that in the beginning. Like uh, uh, a, a common question I get is, well, is all the SEO that you do white hat? And I answer, well, there's no such thing as white hat SEO. If you're doing any kind of SEO, it's not white hat. Um, <laughs> I mean, Google doesn't want anybody doing SEO. So, um, you know, the way, the way I see it is, you know, as long as I can get results like that that's what matters and i i tell them i tell them look there's some things that i do that might not work that might not be okay in a year from now but you know i'm gonna get results and most of the time they're fine with that some people um won't want to do anything and that's fine um but you know using this approach in the past couple of years i've never had anything happen no no penalties no um, huge consequences um, when when ranking somebody, and that's probably because of the importance I place with on-page optimization. But uh, this is this is also a, a, you know something I wanted to point out to you guys that I figured um, would be pretty beneficial to you. So I guess we could go ahead and uh, move on to the next slide. So uh, common mental barriers, and I'm sure some of you guys have already dealt with some of this stuff. Like, uh, you know, you're starting out, you don't have that much experience, or maybe you don't even have a, a portfolio. So you think that, you know, you have to price yourself super cheap, like $99, $100, $150, $200, $300 for a, a pretty big website. You know, you don't have to do that. Um, it it's understandable to feel like you know you have to come in cheap, but it it's really not necessary. Um, you don't need to sacrifice your your profit in order to get a sale. I mean, you don't want to come in um, super high. You don't want to be charging ten thousand dollars for a five page website, but um, you don't need to be charging $100 for it either. And this is this is probably the biggest barrier for a lot of people starting out. They think that they need to be cheap, they need to be affordable, make it hard for a business owner to say no. Um, but you don't need to. You don't need to be cheap. I mean, business owners are paying $500, $1,000, $1,500 for a small office um, a month, just the lease. And then 
commercial rates for power, I mean, that's another $500. So, you know, these businesses are used to spending money. And, uh, you know, if you don't have a portfolio, you could simply say, well, I'm, I'm new starting out. I worked at another company before, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I just wanted to get started and I'm offering a, uh, a discounted rate um, to build my portfolio or, you know, something like that. You, you could have like some kind of, uh, you want to answer the objection before it's an objection. So if they want to say, okay, well, send me five references or something, say, well, okay, I'm, I'm just offering this entry level discount because I'm just starting out and uh, I want to build my portfolio. Um, worked at a previous company before, so I can't claim it at all as my own work. Um, so this is this is what I'm offering. Like this is what I want to do. Instead of charging you eleven hundred dollars, I'm going to charge you six hundred and fifty. Fair enough. So <clears throat> you know, there's there's different ways to approach that. I mean, uh, you don't have to be super cheap in order to get a sale. I mean, how many of you guys? Give me a give me a four if you when you first started that you thought that you could uh, or that you had to come in cheap, like you had to be one of the cheapest on the market. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of you guys. And uh, you know what's funny is uh, the cheaper you price something, you know, the clients, it, it's such a huge difference between um, $1,300 and $300. You know, huge difference in quality the quality of the client. Um, the $300 client wants like a $3,000 job and the $1,300 client, um, you know, they they just let you do whatever. <laughs> you know, so um, there's there's a big difference in quality. So uh, the cheaper, cheaper ones, they usually make you work a lot harder than you need to. Uh, one of the first people I ever sold to I still remember him, and it was just awful. It was a very cheap sale. I think it was $300, um, and I had to break that off in payments. I had to do, like, half before, half after, and um, it was the the biggest pain dealing with him. Uh, and I've never had anybody that was more difficult than him. I mean, things were off by, like, one pixel, um, and he would want to change. And it was just, it was just really bad. So, um, you know, it, it's, you know, the, the more you could, or the higher you could price your services, the better. Um, I mean, as long as it's reasonable enough for them to buy it. Like, you don't need to be super cheap. If you're selling a website, you know, you don't want to be $300 and under. Um, I think a, a good starting point for a lot of people, whether you have, um, just a, a little bit of experience or you're more experienced, but you're just starting out, I think a good range is probably, I would say between $600 and maybe $900. Um, you know, I, I think that's a reasonable range when you're starting out um, just to build your portfolio. You don't need to do work for free in exchange for a review. You don't need to um, sell a 10 page website for $150. Um, you know, you could, you could raise the price on it. Um, if they can't afford it, then it's not a business that you want to do business with really. Um, so, uh, next thing, dealing with indecision. This is something that, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of, a lot of people deal with. They, um, just can't decide what to do, what direction to go, um, whether they should cold call or cold email or whether they should uh, be a sole proprietor or incorporate. Um, you know, their indecision is something that seems to uh, impact a lot of people. Um, you know, how many how many times do you uh, have you dealt with something and just put it off and you keep putting it off because you don't 
you're not real, really ready to make that decision, make the decision and commitment to do whatever it is that you're uh, indecisive about. I mean, that's it, it's something that uh, kind of plagues everybody, and myself included. Um, I think it was a book that I read from uh, Tony Robbins when it talks about, uh, you know, making a choice, like making a decision and how it'll kind of set you free, which, you know, is kind of corny, but it's true. <laughs> Thomas says, uh, I put off divorcing my wife, depends on my mood. <laughs> wow. Um, I don't really know what to say to that. <laughs> Anyway, um, so with the with the Tony Robbins book, um, basically talks about um, well, it was a chapter in the book. It basically talks about you know whatever it is that you can't make a decision on, or whatever it is that's holding you back or that you're putting off. You know, just make a decision today. Like, just make the decision. It is your decision um, whether you want to do this or not, and stick with it. And uh, I've done, I've had to do that numerous times because you just kind of get stuck in this cycle where, um, you know, it, it's an issue and you don't know what to do about it. So you keep on putting it off and then it's still there hanging over your head. So, you know, dealing with indecision, it's tough, but you just, it, it's really as easy as just deciding something to do. Like, whatever it is that you're indecisive about, just make a decision and go with it. Get it out of your head and then adjust later on. If it was the wrong decision, then you learned a valuable lesson and uh, you won't make that decision again. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's better to learn from a mistake, you know, this month than to put it off and put it off and uh, not know what happens until next year you know it's always better to you know just get something done um, action is always better than inaction and then the the next mental barrier is you know the never-ending pre-education cycle this is where um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with um, you you start doing some reading. You want to start your own SEO company, your own web design company. You want to be a freelancer. You want to start this or that, and you start doing a lot of research. And then, what you're researching, you discover certain other areas. So you keep researching, and then you're also researching and learning uh, all these other things that you're coming across. So you're just diving and diving into different tiers of research, and it's an ongoing thing. Like you'd never get out of it. You never stop learning and you never should stop learning. But um, a lot of people feel like they're not ready yet to get started. They're not ready to start their own business. They're not ready to take the plunge. So, you know, they keep learning. And this is one of the problems with the Warrior Forum because people on there will, um, They'll read around posts and stuff, contribute, but they'll also visit the WSO section and just buy some products. They'll just keep buying and buying and buying and pretty much harvesting all the information possible, all the different info products, and do nothing with it. Like they, it just sits on their desktop and they're going for the next product and the next product. And, you know, that's just how life is for them like that's what they're doing they feel like they still need to learn they still need to uh, figure something out to get to the next level before they could start doing whatever it is they want to do um, so the only way to really beat this is you know just do it just just get started um, you might think that well you're not an expert yet but the truth is most business owners don't really need an expert. They just need somebody that could do something that they don't know how to do. I mean, isn't that uh, you know something that business owners need to do? They need to hire employees. They need to find people that could do things that they can't do or don't have time to do. Um, so maybe you're you're not an expert, but do you know more than Bob's 
plumbing company that uh, the guy doesn't even know how to check email? I mean, do you know more than him? I'm sure you do. You know, so you don't need to be an expert. You don't need to um, be some guru or have a hundred uh, clients under your belt in order to get results for a business. You just need to know more than the business owner. Then you're helping them. Like that's that's what you could do. Like that's how you defeat this. That's this is how you get out of the whole um, cycle of info products and information. Uh, the analysis paralysis type stuff. So you just got to do it. You got to realize that you know more than you know most business owners. Maybe you're not an expert in their business, but you do know more than they do about certain things, right? So this is something that uh, you have to consider, and you know you really just gotta just gotta do it. So um, I think that sums that up. Let's see here. All right, so the whole never have all your eggs in one basket thing. I mean, give me a one if you've heard this. I mean, this is one of the the biggest catchphrases on the internet. I mean, if you're on Warrior Forum or any forum or in any blog that talks about um, internet marketing, you probably see people talking about, well, don't keep all your eggs in one basket, you know, things like that. Um, and, you know, diversification is definitely important, but uh, this is a pretty big myth um, for most people because when most people are starting out, they don't have anything to d diversify. Um, they don't have any eggs. They don't even have any baskets. So the whole thing is useless to them. Um, you know, so for example, if, if you're doing web design, not keeping all your eggs in one basket, you're doing web design, you have one client, it is disastrous if you try and diversify. Um, it, it just doesn't make any sense. So let's say, and let's put this in another uh, point of view. Let's say you, you have $200 to invest in a couple stocks. Um, do you really diversify? Do you really, uh, let's say you want to invest in five different stocks. Do you really want to diversify that much with so little money because you're going to get killed by just trade fees? If you're on share builder per trade, you're paying $6.95 per trade. So five different trades like that, that's basically $35. That's almost 20% of you know your overall budget, your cash. You know, that, that doesn't make sense. So maybe um, over the course of a year, if you're lucky, you could beat the market. Maybe you could um, get a 20% return on your investment. But right off the bat, the first day that you invest that money, you lost 20%. You know, it, it doesn't make sense. So um, <laughs> David says, I'm a stock market master. I turned Two hundred dollars into sixty cents in a few months. Nice. <laughs> so um, anyway, the the whole thing with this, um, the catchphrase, the "Don't keep your eggs in all in one basket," um, it it isn't a total myth. Um, it's just a partial myth. There is some truth in it, and uh, this goes into marketing too. But there is some some truth in it because. You know, once you're at a certain level, you should diversify. I mean, look at uh, the big companies. Look at GoDaddy. It started off as a domain registry. Then they uh, pretty much kind of cornered the market. They had a huge market share, and they started implementing other things like uh, security certificates, privacy, hosting, websites. Uh, they they started diversifying, and you know, a lot of different areas. So, um, you know, it, diversification isn't bad. It, you just have to be at a certain level to do it. So um, let's say you're trying to do um, web design. You know, 
so you're you're doing web design you could automatically add hosting to that so um, you could resell hosting but uh, you know do you really want to diversify into SEO when you only have three customers for web design I mean it, it doesn't really make sense diversification is to reduce your risk and expand profits but um, you know when you just have three customers it doesn't make sense to diversify because you haven't perfected um, your you haven't perfected what you do what you started with um, and that doesn't mean that you can't pivot or you know change directions if something's not working but you gotta you gotta master what you're doing you gotta figure out how you can gain market share whether it's you know nationally or just your local area um, and uh, you know, it, it just—it's just something that kind of irks me when I, I see it all the time. Like, don't keep all your eggs in one basket. But you know, the the advice makes sense for some people, but not not people starting out. You know, I see it a lot in the internet marketing section where people are talking about like an AdSense site or you know some kind of niche affiliate Amazon site, and uh, they're saying, well, don't keep all your eggs in one basket. You know, okay, well, if a site's making ten dollars a month, what difference does it make? So that's that's just my view on it. Now, um, there's another view I have on it that's kind of in a different area. It's talking about marketing and how you're getting customers, how you're getting clients. Um, and I think that's something that uh, that could be talked about here as well. Um, so when you diversify uh, your marketing efforts, this is something that you want to do when you have like one technique that's going really well. Like let's say you're cold calling and you're generating uh, 15 new leads a week. So you're doing pretty well. You're, you're generating 15 leads a week, um, cold calling, you're getting a couple sales a week. So, um, and you're doing that on a steady basis. So, you could either scale it up and, and keep going, or you could also diversify. You could um, put some of your your money into pay-per-click or email marketing or um, start doing other activities like Craigslist posting, things like that to complement your cold calling. So you continue cold calling, but you're adding another stream of marketing, that's uh, another stream of leads coming in while you're doing the cold calling. So, and, and that's how it works, whether it's cold calling or whether it's email marketing or whatever technique that you use. It could be going to uh, networking meetings or going door-to-door uh, -to -door for businesses. Um, you wanna, you know, once, once you're good at something and you're generating leads, you're generating clients um, and revenue from a certain certain uh, technique or tactic, uh, it's usually time to start diversifying. I mean, once you have a, a proven, repeatable process that um, allows you to not just get leads, but close the leads and, and generate revenue, and you keep on doing it, you have a formula for it, then it's time to diversify. It's time to add in email marketing or click and text or direct mail. Um, you want you want to diversify and then master that. Um, so if you're cold calling and then you start doing direct mail, master the direct mail. You know, once you have a proven process for that as well, add another other stream, a third stream, and you keep on doing that. So um, you know that that's what that's that's how I see the whole never have all your eggs in one basket. You know, once you have something mastered then diversify you know otherwise you're just not very efficient with your time your focus and your results all right so all right let's next slide here a mobile renegade trick that i use first of all um give me a three if you have mobile renegade give me a five if you don't
Okay, so some people have it, some people don't. Um, okay, so if you're doing if you're doing any kind of business to business stuff, if you do any kind of cold calling or um, email like email harvesting, um, direct mail, uh, it, it's an awesome tool. I definitely recommend it. Um, on my blog, there I have a post somewhere. I, I think after this webinar, you'll be re redirected to a thank you page. Um, and I think I have it linked there where you could see it in action. Um, but if, if you uh, do any kind of business to business stuff, I think it's 100% it's, uh, necessity. Um, but I'm also a little biased. I've been using it for five or six years now and I'm also an affiliate. So um, I'm a little biased, but I love it. And uh, I think a lot of people that use it love it as well. Um, but anyway, this, this trick, is okay so with mobile renegade let's say you're scraping with uh yellow pages and you're scraping emails or um you you select a box and make sure you get you have a, a notebook ready because this is this is something that uh i literally have like a 33 percent conversion with on one call so get your notebook out i'll give you another 15 seconds so I could drink a little bit of water and you could get your notebook ready and take these notes because it's it's going to be awesome. All right, so I hope you guys have your, your notebooks ready. Um, now this, the trick that I use with uh, Mobile Renegade, you, you're scraping whatever you're scraping, yellow book or yellow pages. Um, you want to select a box that says only keep leads with the website. You also want to go in your options and check. Um, there's an option for uh, the mobile checker and which basically goes to uh, whatever website and checks to see if it's mobile compatible or not. I, I, I leave this on, I have it check, and I don't really care if the website's mobile compatible or not, because with this trick, it, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter if it's mobile compatible. Um, now, the next thing is I have a VAST, A-V-A-S-T. I think that's how you pronounce it at least. Um, Avast, uh, it's antivirus and I have it active. Um, there's a free version available. Just get the free version that does, does well enough. And um, when Mobile Renegade scraping and going to these sites to see if it's mobile or not, um, Avast will notify you when there's malware. If there's something wrong, with the site like if there's malware installed it'll alert you and say this site has been blocked or detected you know something dangerous whatever um it'll alert you so um when it, when this happens um you know take a note have your speakers on and these are the businesses that you want to call that you want to talk to and uh you know mobile renegade it shows the business information, uh, business name, phone number, website, all that stuff. Uh, what they don't show you is the owner's name. So if you have the owner's name, it's it's pretty beneficial. What I usually do, uh, first thing I do is I type in the domain name um, in into who dot is. It's who h or no, h w h o dot is and uh, I type in the domain name and it shows the registry information as long as it's not private um, and then usually most of the time it is the owner of the business that registered um, the domain and you could usually check and kind of cross verify um, if they don't have that information then I usually look on Manta I just search the business name um, and look for Manta and see if they have 
a business owner that claimed the profile. Um, and uh, if not, then the next source is LinkedIn. So that that's an easy way to get people that are really open to talking to you. It gives you a reason for the call. Um, so while it might be a cold call, it's it, it's a cold call with purpose. It's a legitimate reason where you could be calling and saying, hey, um, I have this tool where I, I go around different websites and it, it's showing that you have malware, like you have a virus on your website. Um, and that that's a problem. I mean, anybody that goes to your website, if they're able to go to it, um, they could get a virus. You know, you could tell them that, and you could also tell them, well, you're you're also going to be removed from Google. Google's going to block you from the search results. Uh, and, you know, just a quick conversation, say, well, I just wanted to call and let you know this. I, I do this for a living. I build websites. I, I help businesses like yours. Um, a lot of them are very open to talking to you. Um, I mean, I've, of course, the results are few and far between. Um, but you want to you want to constantly run and look for these. These are high quality leads, and about a third of them that you talk to on the first call are going to be very very open to doing something with you. Um, so this is just a little trick that I I like to use with uh, Mobile Renegade. Josh says that uh, he already knows this method. Um, that's that's cool. It's a it's a great method. Um, it's something that I've been using for the last few years now. And uh, some of you, I guess, aren't in the Skype, uh, the Income Bully Mastermind group, so maybe you don't know. I, I did share this um, a, a little while back. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys remembered seeing that or not. We we get pretty crazy and active in there. So um, anyway, that, that kind of sums it up. Um, I guess we're here at the questions and answers part. So uh, if you guys have any questions, ask away, and I will do some answering. I know we covered a lot tonight. We covered... Uh, you know, local SEO, we covered mental barriers, we covered, uh, you know, a lot of different things. So, um, whatever questions you guys have, feel free to ask away. I know Lewis was looking forward to hearing that too. I, I bet he would have some questions, but. I don't know what happened. He just got uh, booted from the webinar, and I don't know. He's in, in Texas where it's tornado country, and uh, hopefully he's not blown away to to Kansas. David says he has a unrelated question. Um, what software automation tools do you use, if any? Um, well, uh, I use a lot of different tools. Um, for local SEO reporting and analysis, I, of course, use um, Bright Local. For CRM, I use uh, CRM, and I tie in email automation with uh, Nutshell CRM and MailChimp, um, also a Weber for inbound stuff. Um, oh, backlink building. Um, I like GSA. I've used SE Nuke in the past. I don't really care for it much. Um, I also use Market Samurai, but uh, you know, really any kind of keyword research tool now um, is it's just using the API from from Google. It's just keyword planner stuff. But the reason I like uh, Market Samurai is because it does take some automation out, where you could do. Uh, or does handle some automation, like uh, you could do some keyword research um, and find some exact match domains all within the software, uh, which, which is pretty neat. Um, I like SEM Rush. I like that a lot. Um, you know, I, I really don't use too many uh, backlinking tools because I don't really 
backlink much. Um, usually the backlinks I build are like tiered backlinking or even some spammy backlinks to top tier properties, not the main site. So um, I don't really have a need for a ton of different pieces of software. Um, I have a lot of software, but I really don't use too much. Um, I don't know if that answers your question at all. I mean, I the most uh, most automation I, I use is not related to um, backlink building. It's more for uh, like business processes, CRM, email automation, um, lead nurturing automation, stuff like that. Any other questions? Andrea, you usually have a question. No question tonight? <laughs> Good deal. Good deal. All right, guys. I guess that uh, kind of wraps it up for tonight. Um, it's been a, a shorter webinar than the two and a half hour one that uh, we've had before. But, uh, I hope you guys had a lot of value in it. I do thank you um, for coming here and hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any questions after this, you know, feel free to email me and um, and uh, I guess I'll, uh, I'll be posting the replay probably in another day. So if you guys want to go back and, and uh, see anything, you'll be able to do so, and Lewis will be able to see it. So thank you guys again for coming. We'll have another webinar Friday, May 1st, uh, 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. And if you guys aren't signed up on the webinar email list, you'll be taken to a thank you page. And uh, make sure you sign up for it. You'll be able to, to get alerts on future webinars. Um, right now, I'm just... When, when I send out an email letting people know, it's to pretty much everybody on a list. So um, I want to make it so there's a separate list for just people that want to get emails for the webinars. So if you're not signed up on the list, sign up for that list. Um, also, if you guys have Twitter, I'm relatively new on Twitter. So go to twitter.com slash income bully and uh, follow me on there. I will follow you back. And uh, talk to you guys soon. Thank you for coming.